What would happen if you could stop worrying so much about what your team was doing all day and instead focus in on what you're supposed to be doing to move your business forward? Sounds like a dream, but right now you're living the nightmare of having to overcoach, overhandhold, and overcheck in on your team's work. Let's put an end to that and instead roll out super clear five hour work plans drum beats, and more of my signature tools that drive accountability and self-sufficiency deep into your team. All you have to do is join a Leadership Lab program, and I'll help you turn your team troubles into triumphs. You'll be learning and growing alongside some peers that will become valuable business friends. So why not go beyond this podcast and join us? It could be the smartest thing you do this year. Book a call with me and see what program would best fit you over at the website, stackingyourteam.com slash programs. She's a mom of two toddlers, an advocate for children on the autism spectrum, a quick start, a book lover, and she's launched her private practice right out of grad school when all of her professors told her not to. Now in her sixth year of operating her practice and all set to make 2020 her best year yet for revenue and the virus hit. If you've been a fan of the show for a while now, you've heard the intro to the podcast each week when I say that I'm aware that many of you are wanting to shift away from delivery of your services into more of a thought leadership role to expand your brand's visibility. Well, today you're going to meet a business owner who's doing it in spite of the pandemic. She's sharing her journey, the ups and downs, and how she's repositioned her services these past few months and how she stays motivated. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Shelley Warren, your team and leadership coach and the chief people officer here at BizChicks, Inc., where along with CEO Natalie Ekdahl, host of the award-winning BizChicks podcast, we coach and train women entrepreneurs to grow their businesses while retaining more profit. My role here as your podcast host is to assist you to ascend even higher as a leader. As you tune in here each Tuesday, you'll discover my admiration for what you're trying to do in the world, and I'm keenly aware that you're wanting to be a better leader. Many of you are wanting to shift from delivery of your services into more of a thought leadership role to expand your brand's visibility and focus on business development. So in order to do that, you need to be surrounded by those who are supporting your vision, a team of right fit people and the structure to lead them. Yes, let's get you all of that. You'll find out that I'm Canadian and a natural leader who shares real life experiences with you. Many learned over the 25 years leading teams at Procter & Gamble in order to accelerate your success. So what does corporate leadership have to do with small business leadership? Plenty because you don't have to be a Fortune 50 corporation to take advantage of the tools, processes, strategies, and concepts that I share here on the podcast. I invite you to pull out what intrigues you and then apply it directly into your business with your team. You know, the largest portion of my career was in operations. That's where I scraped my knuckles more than once in the trenches learning how to lead people and turn around performance. That's also where I learned to stretch myself, always with the same goal in mind. I wanted to be that leader who people actually wanted to work with. I also spent many years in project management, leading specialized technical teams to deliver multi-million dollar product supply projects for billion dollar brands. Those experiences taught me how to handle big pressure, big decisions, big money, big expectations, and of course, big teams. Big doesn't scare me. I like being part of something big. That's why showing up for you each week is so much fun. I get to play a part in all the big things that you're doing. So let's get to it. 
Here's a bit of background about our guest, Jesse Ginsberg. She's a speech language pathologist who specializes in connecting with children on the autism spectrum. She's also the CEO of Pediatric Therapy Playhouse in Los Angeles, where she leads a team of accomplished therapists and admin experts who provide speech, language, and occupational therapy. She's an experienced floor time therapist, social skills therapist, and behavioral support therapist. Jessie enjoys connecting with her peers and speaks at professional conferences at the state and national levels. She also writes for the National Speech Language Pathology and Audiology magazine and is a board member of the District 6 California Speech Language and Hearing Association. Come on, I can't wait for you to meet her. Welcome to the podcast, Jesse. Hi, Shelly. I'm so happy to have you here. I've been wanting to have you come onto the podcast for a while now because I think you have a wonderful story to tell. And the first time we met, it was in California at a one day mastermind. That's the first time that I was I was ever introduced to you. And I remember the immediate thing that I noticed about you, Jesse, that day was your drive. I knew that you were a type of person that had a lot of drive and definitely felt that there was a purpose for you to be here and you loved what you did. And so I'm always attracted to people that are high energy and people who really have a vision of what it is they want to do. That's the kind of people I love to hang out with. So I was super excited to be able to meet you and just even more delighted to be able to work with you. So tell us, tell our listeners about your journey. So tell us, what is it that you do? Who do you do it for? And then we all want to know, why did you make this your career choice? Great. I own a multidisciplinary clinic in LA called Pediatric Therapy Playhouse. We do speech, language, and occupational therapy. And we are a team of nine. And I personally specialize in treating kids with autism and training therapists and doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you even get into that? How did you even realize that this might be the career for you? I worked with this boy in college and you have an on-campus clinic. So I was working with this little eight-year-old boy and he had been born with a congenital disorder where his face was paralyzed, completely Mm -hmm. paralyzed. So he could talk, but he couldn't move his cheeks and his lips. So it was so hard to understand him. And he had just had this surgery called facial reanimation, which is where they take a muscle from your leg and they implant it into your cheek so that you can start to learn to use that muscle. So now he had only one side of his, his lips that would work in his cheek. And my job was to help teach him how to be able to speak clearly and It's not even the work I was doing, honestly. It was that boy's drive himself. He just Mm -hmm. wanted so badly to work on his speech. And he was so dedicated to doing his homework. And it was honestly just his wanting to help himself that caused me to be interested in the field, I think. And so whatever happened to him? I wish I knew. Graduated college. I never heard anything about that boy again. Good question. Oh my, you might want to do a little bit of research and find out about him. But wow, what an undertaking. Yeah. For you and him. For you and him. Yeah. It's funny because obviously I didn't really go into that area of specialty, but it was really a good, awesome. It made an awesome essay when I was applying to grad school. That was for sure because it was so meaningful. So then what happened next? So after I graduated from grad school, when you're in speech, and I should say that I'm an SLP, a speech language pathologist myself. Mm -hmm. So after I graduated, you have to do a year of fellowship or nine months of fellowship. So I moved to the East Coast and I did my fellowship there. And then at the end of my fellowship, I thought this would be a good time to start my own practice. (laughs) 
So I started calling all my professors. I was really close to all my professors in, in grad school. And I started telling them my idea of starting my own practice. And then one by one, they told me how absolutely out of my mind crazy I was. <laughs> that I didn't have enough experience. It wasn't mm-hmm. time. And that wasn't the answer I was looking for. So I kept calling. And then eventually I called one of my professors who was a really huge mentor for me. And this is what she said. She said, you've got the fire girl, go for it. And that was all I had to hear. So she recognized your drive as well and knew that you had enough tenacity that, and enough passion for the work that you were going to go do it. So how did you decide, okay, you decide, I want to have my own private practice. How did you get the funding for that? How, you know, what were all the action steps that you had to take in order to, for doors open? You know, I started off in the cheapest rent I could find. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of therapists, they'll start by doing home visits because they don't want the overhead of a clinic. But I found a clinic that was so cheap originally that once I got my first client who was paying privately coming twice a week, that was enough to cover my rent. Wow. So I just slowly started accepting insurances and that was really how we grew so quickly. And so tell us about what your practice looks like now. Right now, we have five SLPs, Mm -hmm. one OT, and two admin assistants. And tell us about your space. We just moved in in this last year into this new, much bigger office. We have about 10 therapy rooms. And kitchen, a waiting room, and we just love it. It was like what I would imagine. It's like if your parents moved into a new house and then you get to go in and all the kids get to pick their room and their color, their color paint, <laughs> because that's what we did as we moved Aww. in. And then the people who were, who had been here the longest got the rooms with the windows and then everyone got to pick their own room. And I gave them a certain number of colors to pick from, and then they got to pick their paint color. It was really fun. Oh, wow. So there, right there, your dream came to life. You decided after grad school, I'm going to have my own practice, started small, continue to grow. And then that big milestone day where you get to move in to the practice of your dreams with an incredible team and just to be able to just embrace every, every ounce of goodness for that, for that moment. And then, then now 2020, we start 2020. You've been in business now six years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you're year six. So you're an established business. You have an established brand. You're well-known in your industry. You have a solid team. You're kicking off this big, exciting year that we were all so excited about. 2020, brand new decade. Bring it on, bring it on. And then boom, then we're hit with the coronavirus. And you, I kind of joke about it to, even I talked to you about you, to my daughter and talked to Nally about you. And I've said, like, it seemed to me that overnight you pivoted. But I also know that it wasn't actually overnight. So tell us about when did you realize, oh my gosh, I need to pivot and I need to pivot quickly. And then what happened next? Yeah, that was really hard because I had such high hopes for this year. We were grossing and netting more than we ever had. Our team is amazing. Everything really was perfect. So that was really scary to have to make that transition and just the realization that it's real and it's happening. Mm -hmm. So there's another clinic actually in our same building upstairs and the director's daughter, she called me and she said, what are you guys going to do? And I said, I don't know. What are you going to (laughs) do? She said, oh, right now we're planning on staying open. And I said, okay, well, I want to stay open too. And I thought, well, that feels good. At least we're on the same page here. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I was going to call every every big clinic in LA. I called every clinic. I got the email address to every owner. And there are a lot. This is LA. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, it's funny because I'd really never reached out to many of the other clinic owners before, maybe if I needed referrals, but it never anything like this. So I got everyone's email addresses, put us all on one big chain email. And I said, and I called every single place. I talked to every person on the phone. 
And I said, as of now, here are all the clinics on this email list. We are all planning to remain open, just so you know. Wow. It kind of felt good that we were all on the same page. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, it was really just things were changing every day. Yeah, so quickly. So I think that was the middle of the week. And by Saturday, I sent this very long email to everyone on that list. And I said, I think that I said, I'm not one to take a stand because I'm really not in life ever, not religion, politics, anything it is. I'm not that type of person. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm not one to take a stand, but I really feel like our communities look up to us as, you know, they look to us for guidance. Mm -hmm. They trust us. We are healthcare professionals. They believe that we're going to do the things that are the best and the safest for them and their families. And, you know, if you went to your kid's pediatrician and you said, should I take my kid out of school? And they said, no, keep him in school. You would listen. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing with us too. Mm -hmm. So I said, I really feel like it's our responsibility to our community to close to shift over to teletherapy. I just wanted to let you all know this is what we're doing in our clinic. We're closing for a week and then we're reopening and we're going to be doing teletherapy only. So it felt good to just, you know, stand up for what I felt like was the right decision at that moment. So then how did that transition play out? We closed for a week, which was, I really only did that for the sanity of my therapist because I knew we weren't ready. Mm -hmm. I knew that everyone was not ready for that. So we closed for a week. We all got together on Zoom. We did some trainings. We got the software and we just, we slowly started scheduling families. It was a lot. It was a lot of work. And the hardest thing was that I knew that not all of our therapists, well, I shouldn't say not all of them. I should say all of them were not very excited about this. They were doing it, but they weren't Mm -hmm. thrilled because this is not, this isn't isn't the job we signed up for. You know, we want to be person to face to face. We want to see our kids and hug them and meet with them and play with them. And we don't want, you know, this just wasn't, this wasn't the job that they signed up for. What were some of the other fears that they had about moving over to teletherapy? You know, it's funny because I was thinking about a quote, and I think it's Tony Robbins, where he says, people would rather live with familiar pain than unfamiliar pain. Oh, sure. It's the devil you know or the devil you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking... It's not, it's all mindset. It's all that we're just scared. It's not Mm -hmm. that we can't do it and we're not capable. It's just that it's something, it's an unknown territory and it's all new for us and people don't like new. Were you concerned that your parents of your kids were not going to cozy up to the idea? Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. for sure. So yeah, we use the puppy dog sale on them. Do you know what that is? No, tell us about the puppy dog sale. (laughs) I use it all the time, which is the idea is if you went into a pet store and the pet store clerk said to you, okay, would you be more likely to buy a puppy if the clerk said to you, here's this puppy, you're going to have to take it home, feed it, take it to the vet, take care of it for the next 15 years until it dies. (laughs) Or if they said, here's this puppy, why don't you take it home? See if it's a good fit for your family. And if it's not, you could just bring it back. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) so we're always going to go with B we're always more likely to buy a puppy if it seems like something that is temporary and Mm -hmm. we're not fully committing so that's what we did to our families we said we're really excited about teletherapy here's why we think it will work for your child and we're really excited about some of the resources we're learning about why don't we try it out next week and see how it goes and then we'll go from there you know, we didn't say, why don't you come and do teletherapy every, every Tuesday and Thursday for an hour for the next six months until schools open back up. Right. You were really keen to put some thought into your key messaging and then how you're positioning the platform of teletherapy and then how, 
how you and your team are so rallied behind it and excited. So bravo to you. <laughs> wow. So then what were some of the hurdles that you had to work through those first couple of weeks? Because you you are incredible at what you do, but you've had a set and predictable way of delivering your services. Now the way that you've been delivering your services is totally different. So what were some of the the struggling moments that you had where you're not only teaching your team how to deliver this service differently, but you're also working with your kids and those parents on how to receive the services in such a different way. I think the number one thing we did was we prepared the parents for what it was Mm going to look like Mm -hmm. because it's not going to look you know, it's not going to look like it does in the clinic. And for some kids, they come in and their parents wait in the waiting room for them. And then they come out when they're done and we just tell them what we did. It just Mm -hmm. depends, of course, on the child. But now for all kids, probably I would say under the age of four, we are now using a parent coaching model, Mm. which means we are telling them exactly what to say and do in the session. And we are training them, which is something that we do in the clinic as well. It's just now we're doing it through a screen and we're doing it for a lot more of our clients. So I think that the biggest reason or the number one reason families maybe weren't on board is they were just nervous. Sure. They're thinking, well, I take my kid to you. You're the expert. Mm. You know how to do your job. I don't know how to do this. And maybe I don't want to have to be responsible for my child's progress. And it's scary. Or even fearing of, I'll mess up their transformation. They've come such a long way working with you. I don't want to be the the root cause of them having any kind of a setback. Yeah. And I think that that was definitely the biggest fear. And I think that's why the puppy dog sale worked, is we're saying, let's just see how this works and we'll Mm -hmm. go from there. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's actually one of the biggest things that I teach my therapists at all is the best thing we can do is be upfront with Mm -hmm. parents because we just have to be honest with them and let them know why we're doing what we're doing and explain ourselves so that we're always on the same page. So what have been some of the moments of bliss that you've seen or some of the really triumphant things that you've been able to see since you've moved over into telehealth? I mean, I really think that this is in a way, one of the best things that could have happened to some of our parents Hmm. because some of these parents did feel like they weren't good enough or they were incompetent and couldn't help their own kids and they didn't feel empowered. And now they see that they can do it. And they're getting trained and they're getting the opportunity to be coached. And we offer that to every parent who comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, oh, I'd really love to do this coaching with you. And here's why it's so great. But a lot of parents shy away from that. So, I mean, we've had some families who have been fairly hands-off in therapy, but they've really done an amazing job being coached. That's wonderful to see when you can break through that resistance And really empower them. So what have you seen in terms of changes or discoveries about your team now that your team is delivering their therapy online and working remotely? What have you felt and seen and heard from them? They have been way more independent than ever, Hmm. for sure. I used to sit in my office and I'd hear a knock. I've told you this before. I'd hear a knock on my door every five minutes with a question. And now when days go by and I don't hear from anyone, I go, what's going on? (laughs) So, you know, I think it's giving them independence and Mm -hmm. they're all making some of their own decisions, which are, those are really good things for them. But I think that everyone's just being strong for each other because one of the first things, and I think there's a hurdle that a lot of business owners face is that some people would just rather be at home collecting unemployment. Sure. And people are doing it and their their friends are doing it and it's awesome. They're just sitting Mm -hmm. at home watching TV and collecting money. So the very first time meeting we had when I, when I told them that we were going to be closing, I said, I know that it sounds so easy to just 
sit home and collect unemployment, maybe relaxing and maybe even fun. Mm-hmm. Sit home for a month, a few months, wait till this passes and collect unemployment. But the scary reality is that if we all did that, we would not have a clinic to come back to. We would not have a clinic and the kids that you served would be so underserved and there'd be so much critical setbacks mentally and physically because there was just like an immediate disruption with their relationships with you mm-hmm. and their own their own development. So bravo to you for pointing it out that way because I agree with you. There are many pockets of people out there that are, they seem to be quite happy to be off on unemployment, collecting EI. And I, my concern is that those are going to be the same team members that when the restrictions have been lifted, they'll be the first ones kind of knocking on the door saying, well, when can I start again? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the perception of their commitment to the companies that they were a part of is now suddenly changed because of their behavior. Is, when they, you know, I all agreed to do teletherapy. I thought at first, I thought, I'm so glad they're doing this for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I've worked so hard in this business. I'm so glad they're doing this for me. But then I realized they're not doing this for me. They're doing this for each other. Mm-hmm. They're doing this because if one of them decided not to be there or a couple of them, then the other, their close friends who are here working wouldn't have a job to come back to. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's, you know, the beauty of it. Yes. Yeah, the whole idea of it's the, the greater for all. Mm-hmm. Right, look, putting the cause out in front of in front of us, and really staying focused on that. So, tell me about how have you personally changed as a leader through this? Like, what have you discovered about yourself, Jesse? I think I have discovered probably what everyone else has discovered about this time, which is that it feels like this is a test of our willpower and a test <laughs> of our discipline, and. It seems like we can either have two mindsets and I'll take it out of context. Say someone goes through a really bad breakup. They can either say, why did this happen to me? Why did he do this to me? Or they can say, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to live an amazing life despite this that happened to me and is going to make me into a better person. And I think it's the same thing with this. It's okay. First few weeks, I did what I think everyone did, which is I drank wine every night and ate as much top ramen as I could. And I was like, man, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Got out of my routine, all of that. But mm. over time, you're just, if this is the new normal, then what do we want life to look like? And, you know, I'm an early riser, I think, because mm-hmm. of this book I read called The 5 a.m. Club. But I yeah. thought, you know what, I got to get back into my routine, which is getting up at 5 and in this book, they have this 20, 20, 20 formula, which is 20 minutes of exercise, 20 minutes of meditation, 20 minutes of learning or, mm-hmm. or reading. Mm-hmm. So that's what I've been doing now. And I got to do our, our Pilates class on Biz Chicks yes. Facebook group. Yeah. Did you enjoy I that? Did, I did it again this morning. Right on. It's really important to have daily practices. And it's okay for everyone's daily practice to look different, but those daily practices is what really what helps everyone come to center and be able to have the right mindset for the day. Because if there's one thing that people who are handling this situation better than others, what I'm seeing is they're better at managing their mind. And so when they start to see that those thoughts that are starting to bubble up that are no longer serving them, when they're able to flip the script on that, just like with the example that you gave earlier, those are the people that are learning how to maintain the momentum or, or you know, some of them are actually mm-hmm. thriving throughout this time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is not easy. I mean, this is not an easy time, I don't think for anyone, but it's just making the best out of it. And for me, my... I have two kids, two toddlers. Mm -hmm. So I don't have, I can't work all day long like I used to. So now the time that I do have help watching the kids, which is for my mom, then Mm -hmm. I am just working smarter. I'm working shorter hours, but I'm just, I plan exactly what I'm going to do before I start working so that I can get it all done. Hey, 
it's Shelly jumping in here to let you know that Jesse is a member of the Leadership Lab. That's our group coaching program for local service-based business owners who have a team. Some of them have large teams and multiple locations. You can get on the wait list for when it opens up again in September. Just skip over to the website at www.bizchicks.com slash leadership lab. So that's B-I-Z-C-H-I-X dot com slash leadership lab. And yes, there just may be multiple groups. Okay, let's get back to Jesse. And are you giving yourself any kind of a break? Like, are you taking a little easier on yourself in some ways at all? Or are you still being that high performer, high drive Jess? <laughs> I do a lot for me. You know, I read a lot which I consider both for me and, you know, helps business and personal growth. Sure. But yeah, I started, I took my guitar out to play guitar. I just ordered a dress form with my measurements because I've always wanted one so that oh. I could sew and not try things on with pins and needles like I always sure. did. So I've been doing a lot for me. Hmm, that's good. And I know a lot of your other focus has been put towards really developing your thought leadership this year. And you had already done a lot of that work. You had started to do that work at the end of 2019, and then you really ramped it up for 2020. The virus hit, and you, were, you did such a great job, Jess, of looking at this as a whole new opportunity to really elevate your thought leadership even quicker and at a, at a higher platform. So tell us about that moment when you realized, hey, I'm still going to move forward on my thought leadership plans. And then tell us about what your next steps were. Yeah. So last year, I created an online course for SLPs called ASD from the inside out. So it's all about treating kids with autism, starting with working on their intrinsic motivation to communicate and interact. So I launched this course last year and I wasn't going to relaunch it for a while because as you know, I've been focusing on just changing my organizational structure in the mm -hmm. business and just trying to get things to run more smoothly. And I just felt like it wasn't fair to my team for me to be out doing all of that for myself when we still needed to work on getting things smoothed over in the clinic. So I put it on pause even though it's what I love to do more than anything. Mm -hmm. So I kept telling myself after things are running more smoothly, I'll do it again. So I thought maybe at the end of 2020, I would relaunch it or something. But then there was just with all this transition of teletherapy, there was this huge need because for therapists working with kids with autism, now we are moving primarily to a parent coaching model. Yeah. So that means that in order for a therapist to coach a parent, they have to be very confident in their skills and what they're doing and their strategies in order to be able to coach a parent to do all of that. So I posted in a couple of Facebook groups and this was, I was never even planning to launch my course. I just wanted to help. So I posted mm -hmm. in a couple of groups. I said, if I go on Facebook live and talk about teletherapy for kids with autism, would you come? And within a few hours, I had a thousand people say yes. That's incredible. So I thought, oh my God, I better prepare. <laughs> <laughs> I better whip something up here. Preparing. So, I love that, that was, though, Jess, because yeah. I am a big believer of that you sell it first and then you build it. And so that's what you were doing. You were testing the waters out, looking mm -hmm. to see, is, would anybody see any value of this? And then when you get that kind of response, that's the evidence to be able to say, okay, let me go create something incredible for you. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I think I said, if I go on tomorrow to do this, would you come? So I did that that night. I just thought oh, I'll get some stuff together. And then I went on Facebook live the next morning and I think it's gotten maybe like 15,000 views in the past couple of weeks, which is a lot for me. <laughs> That's incredible. And in true high quick start form, you decided that night, I'll just whip this together. I know what I'll do. And, and you just did. You just moved forward and, and were able to execute it the next day. And like you said, now there's over 15,000 people that have viewed that 
Yeah. So I just thought it was a lot of information that could help everyone in that time. And I wasn't ever even planning on launching my course again, but I had just such positive feedback from that. I was not expecting it at all. I mean, I had so many people send me messages and emails and just say the most amazing things and ask about the course. So I thought, oh, why not? I'll just launch it again. But I didn't just want to go launch it all willy nilly. I wanted to do it strategically. So then I read, I read the book Launch by Jeff Walker, where Mm -hmm. he gives some strategies for launching, like using deadlines and all this stuff. So I combined what I learned from last year from my business coach. She kind of coached me through launching the first time. So I took what I learned from her and combined Mm -hmm. it with what I'd read in this book and then relaunched it. And it did way better than I expected. It did do way better than what you expected. So tell us, what were those results? Um, well, we I sold about double of what my goal was. Mm-hmm. And I was just so thankful because it's it's really not about the money in this course. And it's not, do I want to make money from selling it? Of course. I spent hours and hours and hours and sure. it took a lot of time away from my clinic to develop that course. Of course, I want to make money from it. But it really is so much more than Mm -hmm. the money. It's, I want therapists, us to be changing the ways that we're treating kids with autism, not treat like treat them well or poorly, but treat them in therapy. And I really want us to be focusing more on building intrinsic motivation, because in this world that we're living in, and it's not just kids on the spectrum, it's all kids, really. We're living in this world where we are relying on external rewards for everything, Mm -hmm. which looks like if you do your homework, then you can have a cookie. If you brush your teeth, then I'll give you a high five. If you know, it's all of this, that's an external reinforcer because it's something that's coming from the outside to reinforce the behavior. And there's all this research that's not even new research that shows that things like using the statement, if, then, mm-hmm. which so many parents do, mm-hmm. and very, very common, especially with working with kids with autism, Yeah, that when we use that, if you do this, then you do this, all mm-hmm. you're doing is making the if activity less desirable for the child. Yeah. It's almost uh, punitive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's all about teaching how can we truly motivate kids to want to communicate and want to interact with us. And it's about building their intrinsic motivation. I want this child to look at me and play with me because it feels good and because I'm funny and because he wants to connect with me, not because Mm -hmm. he's going to get something for doing it. Right. Well, you lived that philosophy during that first Facebook Live, Jess, which I tuned into because I wanted to see you in action. And I was blown away at how deeply you showed up for your peers and how deeply you were offering so much goodwill. You were breaking down techniques, proven techniques that you have tried yourself and you had seen such a great reaction, not just from the kids that you work with, but the parents, because you were trying to reinforce the fact that you that all of the therapists need to switch over to this parent coaching model. And what you were doing was saying, look, It is a big switch, but I'm going to show you how you can do it. I'm going to show you all my tips, all my tricks, and the amount of things that you were giving to them, (laughs) the downloads, the here, let me show you how to do this. And I loved your style of how you taught because not everybody was meant to teach. There's a lot of brilliant women in the world and a lot of brilliant men in the world, but they're not all cut out to teach. You have a great teaching style and it was wonderful as your coach to sit there and watch all those comments come through on Facebook and all the accolades that you're getting and genuine thank like people were so thankful for you taking the time to show them how to do these things because it boosted their confidence for them to be able to go forward and say okay I now know how I can go do this you really empowered them so it was wonderful for you to see but now that I'm listening to you talk about the if and the then and and your whole philosophy on that, it just, it hit me that that's exactly what you did 
on that Facebook Live. That was exactly the foundation of how you showed up that day. Thank you. It's funny yeah. because when I launched my course the first time, my business coach said, you need to go on Facebook Live every day mm-hmm. for the week you're launching. And I was terrified. I mean, I was like, I hope no one tunes in. I can't get my thoughts together. Even I practice and I just was not ready to go on Facebook Live. But that, when I went on a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. that's stuff I could stay in my sleep because I say it so often. Mm-hmm. Now, so I think it's just it's just funny because that is not something that is just something you could pick up and do. I think on Facebook Live, it's something you have to get comfortable with over time. Yeah, it's a real hurdle, and I will admit it's a hurdle for me too. It's one of it's. I'm very comfortable on stage. I am less comfortable on video, and so it's one of those things. It's, it's whatever you've been conditioned to, and how much practice you're getting. I didn't realize how awkward it would be. Because when you're in a conversation, you're getting this feedback, right? Sure. This auditory feedback. When you're on mm-hmm. Facebook Live, you're just talking and there's just no one. But when you're watching it, you're not feeling that way. Yeah. It's just, it was funny. You yeah, read, it's, I couldn't it's, really read the comments. It was distracting. There's mm-hmm. a lot to learn. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real skill set for sure. So now that you you did the Facebook Live, you launched your course. And you're seeing this incredible interest and incredible uptake for it. What has that sparked you to think about in terms of you as a leader and what you want to do next in your business? I think that, I mean, this all ties back into being part of your leadership lab, because my goal in that was how can I change my organizational structure and get my clinic to run so that I don't have to be there to make day-to-day decisions. Mm-hmm. Because a big moment for me was at, was at BizChicks Live and I was there and it was during the week. I forget which days, or I think there were, there was at least one weekday or something. Yep, there was. Yeah. And I was just getting phone calls, texts all day, putting out mm. fires. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I can't even step away from my yeah. business. So I, you know, I was so, I was hesitant and scared to join the leadership lab because Mm -hmm. it's an investment, obviously, Mm -hmm. but I'm not kidding, Shelly. After the first class we had in that, my money was well worth it. Like I would have paid that much just to get what I did out of the very first meeting that we had together. And that was because my perspective changed so much. And all of a sudden I was just ready to change everything. And I started taking all the steps I needed to get there. I'm still working on that, but. Hey, we're all, you know, the type of people I like to work with are people who realize that their cake's not fully baked, right? Like I love people who are still in that growth mindset, but they also understand that they're continual learners. And it doesn't matter what age we are. It doesn't matter how much we master our particular career choice or a particular realm of work that we want to do, there's still so much to learn. And so you came into the leadership lab with an intention. And I think that was what's really has been able to help you stay focused and get the results that you have is you knew the reason why I'm here (laughs) and you declared it out loud. The reason why I'm here is because I want to be able to move over into thought leadership in a big way. And I know that in order for me to do that, I have to have a strong foundation. And it's not just having great team members. It's making sure that you've got those team members in the right roles. You've got the structure, the expectations, the drum beats, the tools, the concepts. And then you had this freedom because I remember you on one of our, on one of our monthly calls talking about how incredible it is for you. Now that you're on telehealth, and your team is all out doing what they're, what they're being paid to do, right? They're doing exactly what they're being paid to do. And now you had this sense of freedom. You had like a whole day stretched ahead of you. We were like, hey, I have this whole day now. And it's that excitement of what's the choices that I'm going to focus on today? Oh, yeah. Huge. Yeah, I think for us, just developing processes processes? All ways of pronouncing that word works for me. (laughs) So that was the big thing for me. And I think one of the biggest things we did that got me to this place was, and you've probably read 
the pumpkin plan. Mm -hmm. But for anyone who doesn't know what it is, you know, the idea is that all of these clients who are these little pumpkins, bad pumpkins, and they're not fun to work with, and it's not exciting for you, and they're a headache for you, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And that was the first step. And I'm not kidding. We had a meeting because after you taught me to have these drum beats in the clinic, we started doing a meeting with everyone every month. Mm -hmm. And in one meeting, I sat down and I did this exercise from the book, which was, okay, who are your, if you were to be stuck on a desert island with a few of your clients, who would you want to be stuck on that desert island island with? Who are your favorite people to work with and why? And then the opposite. I said, if you, like, who are your least favorite clients to work Mm -hmm. with and families and why? Mm -hmm. And the most interesting thing was that the people who they didn't enjoy working with, the reason they didn't enjoy working with them was not because the kids were hard. It was because the parents were hard. Yeah. It was because the parents were defensive or the parents didn't trust us and, Mm -hmm. or they were not good with their attendance. It wasn't the kid. It's never the kid, you know, it's the family. So ironically, the families who were on that list, I went as because I didn't know who they would say. Mm -hmm. As they're saying the names to me, I'm thinking, these are the families who don't pay. These are the families (laughs) who have passed due payments or Mm -hmm. always pay late. Mm -hmm. There was that such a strong correlation. Yeah. So then we made a new policy as of January. We said, if you have a past due balance for 2019, you cannot start Mm -hmm. your sessions in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding. The, that entire list of clients dropped off. Wow. And that was so, I think, freeing for the therapists too, to just be able to know that the people who were giving them a headache, they were also giving me a headache and we no longer have to deal with them. Yeah. It's just, I know I harp on this all the time, but I really do believe that you have to take a stand at some point in your business journey and say, no more mediocre team members. And I'm only working with my very best ideal clients. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will say, oh yes, I'm only, you know, I'm only targeting ideal clients. But do you really have a definition of what an ideal client is for you personally and your team? Because I find too many times we hang on to clients and team members because they, you know, they've been with me since the day I opened my clinic. And there's this sense of obligation and a high level of tolerance for either a team member or a client. And so bravo to you for even opening up that conversation with your team, Jesse, because in those moments, you're taking advantage of everyone being together and turning that team meeting into a teachable moment for everyone, which then in turn is greatly going to impact your business. And Mm -hmm. it's uncanny how, <laughs> as they were describing these clients that they don't want to, it's essentially parents because it's not the kids, but the yeah. parents that they didn't want to work anymore were also the ones that were the faulty payment owners and the people that were just difficult to work with. Yeah. I would have never put that together either if we hadn't done that exercise, mm-hmm. but it felt really good to start putting up some really clear boundaries with parents. And then from then on, we put every single family in 2020 on auto pay. Yeah, way to go. And we'd never done that before. We'd never just charge credit cards, but we have their we have their signatures on file that we could charge their cards and we're just way more on top of it in that sense. And then the next one, which is the second book, which is Clockwork, yeah, was amazing and that's just all about setting up systems so that everything can run smoothly. And I love the analogy. I think it's it part of Clockwork, which is It's not, it's in the pumpkin plan at the very end, I forget. But it's the analogy that anyone could walk on a plane and open that emergency instructions manual. And no matter what language they speak, what Mm -hmm. age they are, they know what to do. They could pick up that manual and they know how to do it. And they said, in that book, every single system in your business should be as easy as that. Yeah, we like to make sure that whenever we're communicating anything or building anything, that it's at that grade six level, right? So that there's no no gray areas. Use as many pictures as you can. Strip 
the language and the vocabulary down so that no one's trying to read between the lines or no one's getting their perspective of what the intention here is mixed up. So yeah, this is all testament to your drive and your intention on being the best leader that you can be. And you're such a continual learner, Jess. It's so fun for you to be able to see. I know recently this week, you put a post in our in our Leadership Lab Facebook group <laughs> saying, I need more books to read. What are you reading? And it's that thirst for knowledge. And then it, what that does is it sparks that same thirst for the rest of the members of that group. And then the banter back and forth between all of you talking about why you love that particular book or that particular author and what you, you know, how you took that learning and applied it into your business, then that really encourages other people to go and carve out some time in their week to go and read as well. One of the, I honestly feel like it was a turning point in my life was in last fall when I was watching the documentary Bill's Brain about Bill Gates. Yeah. And they interview his assistant. And his assistant said, Bill understands that time is finite. It's the only resource that you can't buy more of. Mm. And he's got the same 24 hours in a day that the rest of us have. Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh, look what he does in his 24 hours. And here I am watching Real Housewives till I'm blue in the face. (laughs) What am I doing? And they talk about how he reads so much and he goes on vacation. He takes 15 books with him. Mm -hmm. So literally that night I started reading way more. I used to read maybe four books a year or something. Mm -hmm. And now I read at least one book a week, often more. Mm -hmm. I think in the last week and a half, I've read four books, but Mm -hmm. it's the types of books where I'm just reading these books. And then I just think, how did I live my life before I knew what was in here? And it's just, It's just so interesting because with the quarantine, it's so easy to sit around and be sad and feel victimized, Mm -hmm. but there is so much we can take away from it. And there is such a silver lining and we get time to do things that maybe we didn't get time to do before. And there's just, there's a lot to learn and a lot of ways that we can organize our time better. Absolutely. And it especially works for people who have a personality where they're genuinely curious. They're like, you're just always looking to learn something new. And, and I know a lot of times people can put a lot of pressure on them that says, oh, I'm supposed to be reading you know, so many books a month or so many books a year. But it's really about taking that resource and going through it in whichever way best suits you. If you're a skimmer, do the skim. If you are a, you know, you wouldn't dream of skipping a chapter and you have to read every single chapter. I mean, for myself, I'm a highlighter. I very much am highlighting and I'm a note taker and I, you know, write in the margins of the book. And my home library is one of my most cherished things that I own. If if there was ever a fire in my house, it would not be good because I would be running back in to (laughs) save my books. I have just so many books. So I agree with you. This particular moment in time, we have all the time we need to read. It's really about choosing what's interesting to you and whether you actually have a physical book in your hand or whether you're listening to Audible or whoever you're deciding to do it. Just being able to have that milestone moment to celebrate, to come out of the pandemic saying, wow, you know, I learned this and this and this. Yeah, that's true. There was a meme or something going around saying, Mm -hmm. How annoying are all the people who are saying they're going to come out of the pandemic with a new skill? (laughs) Well, I do find, I mean, I'm always searching for harmony. So I do get a little offensive when I hear people, you know, like lay on expectations where, you know, you're essentially, (laughs) you've lost your purpose in life if you haven't decided to do one significant thing throughout this pandemic. But for many people, that one significant thing is teaching their kids how to cook. I mean, cooking, laundry, how to clean the house. Those are life skills that will always serve your child. And you can start teaching those skills at a very young age. So deciding that that's the one thing that I'm going to come out of this pandemic as, as a parent who has taught my child some life skills, they get a big gold star in my book for that, even though they didn't sit down and write the great American novel, or they didn't learn how to speak Japanese. 
they poured into their family. And to me, that's just as powerful. Oh, yeah. I just taught, I did help, had my three year old help me with laundry for the first time ever. And it was the best thing he's ever done. Mm. Kids just, they just want to do that stuff. It's so yeah. funny. Yeah, they want to help. So yeah. tell us, Jess, what are you most excited about over the next couple of months? And tell us how can our listeners stay more connected to you? I'm definitely excited to keep going with all of this work that I'm doing with other therapists. Now I have all these people going through my course, which is so exciting. Mm -hmm. So I get to talk to them about it and, and their clients. And we are in a private Facebook group together. So we get to share a lot of information. So that's going to be really fun to see how that pans out and talk to everyone and just continue with supporting my team the best I can. Mm -hmm. Well, you're also a lovely member of our leadership lab and you pour out and into a lot of those women that are in that group. And it's lovely to watch the dynamics of all the personalities in there and how much genuine support you're giving to each other. It's such a trying time right now. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. The, the amazing thing about the women in that group is that you could post, you can't just post a question that you have anywhere and expect to get an answer from someone who knows every single woman in that group has mm -hmm. so much knowledge and mm -hmm. I just fully trust their opinion and the information they give. So it's just so yeah. nice to be able to ask a question and know you're getting really, I mean, they spend so much time responding to questions that are posted and it's so amazing. Yeah, and they're experts in their own fields. So it's it's like the ultimate shortcut. You go in and you ask a question in the group and an expert is giving mm -hmm. you a reply. Yeah. It's super cool. So tell us, how can people sign up for your course? How can people follow you? Like which platform are you, where can we find you most often? Most of my resources that I post are on Facebook and on my page, which is Jesse Ginsburg, speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. But if that's too much of a mouthful to remember, my website is ASD from the inside out.com. So ASD, autism spectrum disorder from the inside out.com. And I have a ton of blogs on there, lots of free downloads and resources in the blog. And my course is not open now. And I don't know when I will open it again, but we'll see. But they we'll can reach out to that. you. They can DM you and get on the wait list for sure. Yeah. And if they want to come onto the Facebook page and let me know, I'm, I'll keep them posted. Well, that's wonderful. And I'll make sure that all of these links are in the show notes. So wherever you're listening right now, make sure you just scroll down and you'll find the links there. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have you come on to the podcast today, Jess, and share your journey, not only about how you launched your private practice, but I find at this point in history, we need to hear more and more real life stories from real life business owners who are working through this pandemic and pivoting and learning and realizing that there's so many opportunities that are happening right now, but I find people don't, it doesn't resonate with everyone. They really need to hear these kind of stories. So thanks so much for being so open with us. Of course. Thank you for having me, Shelley. And I'll see you in the Leadership Lab. So here's the thing. Jessie naturally loves to learn, and she's not afraid to buy the book, read it, and apply it, or listen to the podcast and apply it, or join a coaching program, and yes, apply those learnings too. It's true, a lot of people soak up a lot of content, or even collect content. It's the people who are driven to invest in their personal development who take what they've learned and apply it directly into their business, their team, and their lives that end up meeting or exceeding their goals. Jessie's desire to help her peers learn and then apply the parent coaching model is truly going to impact so many families and so many therapy practices. And she's just getting started with her thought leadership. What did you think about her puppy dog sales method? 
I thought that was genius and I'll definitely be using it. And her philosophy about how parents who use external reinforcement to motivate kids to do things, it isn't actually effective. Instinctive motivation is how we truly impact children to want to learn and connect with those who are their teachers. And that includes parents. And wasn't that fascinating when she realized that the families that her team no longer wanted to work with were the exact same families who were faulty payers. It's so worthwhile to ask your team to open up and tell you about what they're tolerating. So insightful. You know, when Jessie joined the Leadership Lab, there was a reason for her to join. She had an intention and she wasn't afraid to declare it. She wanted to move over into thought leadership in a big way. She said, how can I change my organizational structure and get my clinic to run so that I don't have to be there to make day-to-day decisions? And after attending the first class in the lab, she felt she got her money's worth immediately and she was ready to make changes. She's been continuing to refine her org structure, her operations, her team systems, and you heard how much she enjoys learning about leadership. She's seeing that with the right framework set up in her practice, she now has the freedom to focus on her thought leadership and develop courses, more methodologies, and do more speaking engagements and writings. These kinds of real life examples of how business owners are successfully navigating their way through this unusual time can remind us that we're not alone and can also spark some motivation for anyone who's feeling stuck. And you heard Jesse tell you that she's enjoying the Pilates class in the coop. That's our free Facebook group for women who have established businesses. During the pandemic, Natalie and our BizChicks team are inviting experts to come in and host online wellness classes to help us all stay sharp. So if you're not already a member of the Coop, just pop over to the website at bizchicks.com slash join, and then I'll see you there in the Coop. So I'll leave you this week to consider this. As a leader, some days can be overwhelming. Other days are full of blissful moments when you catch a glimpse into how you're impacting others. When we have highs and lows, and every single business really does have both, especially right now, it can feel like weeks can slip by and all the things that you wanted to get done during that time, well, it just didn't get done. Quarters can go by when you realize that some of your goals have simply slid over into the next month, again, being overshadowed by a crisis like this pandemic or a massive win like stepping up into your thought leadership or a serious performance problem with a team member who may not be doing so well while working from home. Either way, when we don't make progress on what our business needs in order to grow, it can make us feel, well, unproductive and sometimes anxious. It helps to have someone who's got your back, is ready to listen and ready to strategize with you so that you can really move forward and feel fully supported doing it. I am here for you and ready to support you as your coach. Coaching is an investment in time money, and mental attitude. It's also a personal commitment to you as a woman who's leading a business and a team and also being an incredible human for those that you love. I have an opening for one-to-one coaching starting in May. So if that feels aligned to your goals, just reach out to me at Shelly at bizchicks.com. That's Shelly with an I at bizchicks.com. And I'll send you an intake form so that you can tell me about your business, your team, and what looks like help to you. I'll then circle back with you and we'll get together on a call and talk about what a custom one-to-one coaching plan would look like for you. You can also visit the website and catch a mini video that Natalie and I did for you that explains our programs, our strategy sessions, our one-to-one coaching program, 
And of course, you can get on the wait list there for the Leadership Lab. You know, leadership can be exciting, challenging, and lonely at times. So don't go it alone. Let me help you create the team and the leadership structure you've been craving. So until next time, remember, if you have a dream, you need a team. So let's get stacking yours today and please stay well. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Stacking Your Team. Please click subscribe in your podcast app so you never miss an episode. And head on over to bizchicks.com slash join to get access to the private Facebook group we host for women entrepreneurs. It is a virtual gathering space for the kindest, smartest, and most savvy women entrepreneurs around the globe who are scaling their businesses and stacking their teams. The group is free to join, and when you do, you get access to the complimentary downloads associated with both of our podcasts. We include the links in our weekly newsletter. Again, go to bizchicks.com slash join. That's B-I-Z-C-H-I-X dot com slash J-O-I-N to get access. And listen to us every Tuesday for a new episode of Stacking Your Team and Thursdays for a new episode of the Biz Chicks podcast. No matter where you have come from or where you are going, you are the leader your company needs and you are worthy of being CEO. Stay focused, Biz Chicks, and go stack your team. Oh, 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 oh